Dobro veče i dobro došli. Na drugo predavanje je u nizu ovogodišnjih predavanja grupe 22. Hvala vam što ste s nama večeras u ovaj kasni sat za zagrebačka predavanja. Ja sam Mladen Donazer, član grupe 22 i biću večeras moderator rasprave i ovih uvodnih predavanja. Ovo je predavanje koje organizira grupa 22 u Barčarstvu sa Heidrich Bell Stiftungom iz Zagreba i festivalom znanosti iznimno ovaj put. Naš prvi i nekotični uvodničar večeras je bio premijer Milanović, koji je jučer izjavio da bez rasta ljudi će se pitati je li demokracija pravi model. Pa onda za večeras možemo uz ovaj naslov koji smo objavili u programu Festivala znanosti i u pozivnicama imati alternativni naslov da ako ne možemo ili nećemo ekonomski rasti, da li to onda znači da ćemo se potući ili podrebnuti eventualno tiraniji. Cijelo predavanje kao što je najavljeno i onda rasprava koja slijedi bit će na engleskom jeziku, ali zato što, kao što vam je Danijela, onima koji su bili prošli put objasnila da se pokušavamo fokusirati na stvarno korisno znanje, ja sam smatrao da bi bilo korisno da uvodno ovo izlaganje je održen na hrvatskom, pogotovo što sam ja po profesiji filozof i fizičar, tako da ova ekonomska teorija mi je potpuno nova, to moram sve sa ovih kartica čitati, tako da iza sebe i za one koji su ne ekonomisti među vama, jedan Wikipedia pregled osnovnih pojmova koje će naši gosti večeras onda koristiti u svojim argumentima. Dakle, BDP ili bruto domaći proizvod je, kaže Wikipedia, tršišna vrijednost svih službeno priznatih finalnih roba i usluga koje su proizvedene u nekoj zemlji ili u nekom društvu u nekom vremenskom periodu, najčešće od godinu dana. Ekonomski rast je onda povećanje količine roba i usluga koje ta država ili društvo proizvede opet u nekom periodu. Važno je da to povećanje je usko povezano s količinom resursa i energije koje društvo preradi i onda izbaci ili odbaci kao otpadne tvari i što je najvažnije kao i otpadne plinove. A taj ekonomski rast mjeri se ili standardno se i prikazuje kao postotak povećanja onog BDP-a koji je sve robe i usluge koje je društvo proizvede itd. Dakle, to je rast o kojem je premijer govorio u naslovu i čerašnjem večernjaku. Naravno, možemo se pitati da li to što BDP mjeri, a onda i ekonomski rast mjeri, zaista mjeri i pokazatelje dobrobiti, ono zbog čega zapravo obavljamo ekonomsku aktivnost i svi skupaj participiramo u nekom društvenom nakupretku, pa imamo i druge indekse i druga mjerila takve dobrobiti, kao što su indeks ljudskog razvoja koji razvija Ujedinjeni narodi, skraćeno sa engleskog Human Development Index, onda HDI, pa imamo Genuine Progress Indicator koji su razvijela grupa američkih znanstvenika prije par desetaka godina. Jučer se pojavila vijest da je razvijeni novi Social Progress Indicator kao zamjena za BDP, ali naravno imamo i pokazatelje cijene koju plaćamo već sada ili ćemo plaćati u skoroj budućnosti za dobrobit koju ostvarujemo kroz ekonomski rast. To mjerimo ekonomskim otiskom, ili skraćeno ecological footprintom, ne skraćeno nego na engleskom, a to znači mjereno danas taj ekološki otisak kaže da recentno globalno stanovništvo uzima 50% više iz planetarnih zaliha nego što planeta može tih zaliha obnoviti. Što će reći da živimo na dug, a uglavnom taj dug ostvarujemo zbog CO2 koji kao otpad energetskih procesa bacamo u atmosferu. To nas onda naravno dovodi i do pitanja koliko se još možemo zaduživati na taj način prije nego li se zalihe koje crpimo potpuno iskrazne. Postoje neobnovljivi resursi koji se iscrpljuju, pa onda nema dovoljno tih istih za rast drugih ljudi na zemlji i za buduće generacije. 35 od 70 ugroženih ekosustava je na granici kolapsa. Pitanje je koliko onda i obnovljivi resursi kao što ekosustavi se mogu smatrati su pouzdano nešto na što se možemo osloniti za strategije daljnjeg rasta. A naravno onda tu je i ta dramatična i nagla promjena planetarnog klimatskog sustava, uglavnom zbog čovjekovih ekonomskih aktivnosti uzrokovane. Večeras ćete čuti, između ostalog će se govornici pozvati na dva moguće rješenja. Prvo takvo rješenje bilo bi okrenuti se pametnom ili zelenom rastu, 
što bi značilo zadržati dobrobiti trajnog povećanja BDP-a sjetite se onih roba i usluga, ali tako da se ne iscrpljuju resursi mimo minimalne granice koliko je nužno i bez ili opet uz minimalno stvaranje štetnih nus proizvoda. Na engleskom najčešće takvu strategiju nazivamo decoupling ili odvajanje ekonomskog rasta, ovoga što mjeri rast BDP-a od materijalne i energetske najviše fosilne baze. Međutim, na globalnoj razini ona trenutno ne uspjeva. Da pa će posljednjih godina unatoči ekonomske krizi povećava se i potrošnje energije, i CO2 zagađenje, raste količina materijala koje se iskoristavaju i tako dalje. Do te mjere da postoji naslovi od strane financijskih kuća, a ne zelenih organizacija, koji kažu da je prekasno da zadržimo promjenu klime ispod prosječnih dva stupnja Celzija. Drugo rješenje bi onda bio taj famozni odrast ili degrowth na engleskom, a to bi bilo namjerno, strateško i društveno održivo, a s druge strane i pravično, smanjenje i onda u konačnici i stabilizacija količine resursa i energije koje društvo troši i upotrebljava za ekonomske procese. Bilo bi ciljano smanjenje proizvodnje roba i usluga za koje znamo da imaju štetni učinak i ono što je ključno i o čemu ćemo se vraćati na u današnjoj raspravi izgleda da takva strategija nikako ne ide sa pokušajem ili sa strategijom povećanja BDP-a kako bi recimo decoupling trebao tražiti. U svakom slučaju na globalnoj razini granice rasta se rapidno dostižu, pitanje je kako ćemo pravilno raspodijeliti ovo što je ostalo do granica i kako onda jednom kad lupimo u taj stakljeni strop granica podijeliti ono što imamo. Šta to znači za malu Hrvatsku? u globalnoj priči, vrlo mala zemlja sa vrlo malim CO2 otiskom. BDP ima na razini samo 65% prosjeka EU zemalja, ali s druge strane, indeks ljudskog razvoja ima vrlo visok, dakle spada u vrlo visoko razvijene zemlje i klub najrazvijenijih zemalja na svijetu 50 komada tih najrazvijenijih. Doduše pri samom dnu kluba, ali u klubu je. Nacionalni ekološki otisak je 50% veći nego obnovljivi potencijal samog hrvatskog teritorija. To znači da svi mi danas trebamo još pola Hrvatske nabaviti od negdje drugdje kako bi cirkularno zatvorili količinu resursa koje crpimo za robe i usluge koje koristimo i kako bi se reciklirao otpad koji je odbacio. Zanimljivo je da 40% potrošnje vode u Hrvatskoj nastaje izvan hrvatskih granica, znači neće tuđu vodu trošiti nekako svoje imamo u izobilju kada koristimo robe i usluge koje koristimo svakodobno. S druge strane, i vjerujem da je i premijer toga svjestan, zemlja velikih kontradikcija, tako fina razvojna putanja, ali ogromna nejednakost u raspodijeli te utržene vrijednosti roba i usluga koje se proizvedu unutar hrvatske države i hrvatskog društva, da pa će nejednakost ima najviši utjecaj na razvijenost Hrvatske od svih zemalja u regiji, dakle Hrvatska razina razvijenosti padne najviše kad se uključi i mjerilo nejednakosti. 1,38 miliona građana je službeno siromašno prema EU statistici, to je preko 30%. Visok je udio cijene hrane u potrošnji kućanstva, to je troška za hranu u potrošnji kućanstva, a cijene hrane i dalje rastu danas na EU novinama daljnjih 30%. To dakle odcrtava pozadinu i kontekst u kojem večeras otvaramo raspravu. Dva su predavača s nama i sad konačno prebacit ću se i na taj famozni engleski na kojem radimo. We've got two ecological economists with us tonight. They both agree that we're reaching global limits of material growth. What they take as a point of disagreement and something we can then discuss on later is what the mid-term strategies for creation, society and economy should be based upon accepting this fact that in the long run we're hitting a growth ceiling. We've got with us tonight Dr. Igor Matutinovic of the GFK Institute and Brian Davy of most recently of FASTA uh, from Dublin. Uh, I don't want to take up any more of the time because we all want to end up in Kriviput um, to have a beer later. So I suggest uh, Igor takes away with uh, presenting his point. I have to use microphone or... You have to, or you can shout loud enough, but... Uh, can you hear me? Or... No. Better with microphone. Okay. Okay. Dobar večer. Da, to je sve što ću reći sad na hrvatskom. Ok. Uh, okay. So, 
as you heard, I will argue that Croatia needs a growth, but different growth than what we have had in the past 20 years. And that this growth is necessary not in order only, uh, not only in order to face the consequences of high unemployment and high social inequality that Martin just mentioned, but also to face the challenges that are lying ahead and they are connected with climate change and energy crisis. So I will talk about how I see the problem. Then a little bit of theory of complex system paradigm, which I think it is necessary to deal with these issues which are complex and not easy to solve because if they were easy, then somebody would already have the solution. And then I will talk how I think that Croatia should deal with it. So just before starting, I see the process as a metaphor for getting out of the dominant paradigm and obsession of economic growth. I don't see it yet as a political problem of change, but something that should shape primarily our minds. So locally, as you know, I will not go through it. I just want to emphasize that high unemployment and high youth unemployment are socially unsustainable. Also from the terms, uh, from the standpoint of public debt, it's not that much important, but it has some impact on an economy uh, that needs foreign investments, needs foreign capital in order to uh, pursue economic restructuring that I see is necessary to face the chances that lie ahead. And just to view on industrial production, we are still below uh, 1990 and still shrinking. So uh, we live in an industrialist world. And if you want to have a resilient, strong economy, then you need to have some uh, strong or relatively strong industry. Without it, you are always open uh, to whatever happens in the world markets, Means, meaning that uh, even crucial things you need to import, and to import these crucial things, you need to earn foreign currency from some, somewhere else. Uh, what is problem uh, beyond this uh, macroeconomic issues that we know very well is that Croatia is still importing 50% of its food necessities and that we have actually degraded from the 80s, still from the 80s, our agricultural sector. So we have lost nearly two thirds of farmland, uh, decreased the livestock. Uh, we don't use nearly 50% of uh, arable land, so on and so on. And this is actually unsustainable, especially you will see later when we take it into the context of energy crisis and climate change. Uh, per capita energy of consumption is relatively low in the European context. We produce locally 20, so 25% of, uh, of the primary energy production is renewable. So it is not a bad starting point to develop further the renewable energy sector. But we import, of course, 90% of fossil fuels. And interesting enough, uh, when we take into consideration our <coughs> energy consumption and primary energy, primary energy uh, production, then we see that we are self-sufficient at about 55%. That means that we, if we would not exporting, we would be able to cover 55% of our energy needs. But the projections are towards decreasing because we are depleting our stocks small stocks of gas and uh, oil. And if we want to reverse this trend, we will definitely need investments in renewables. And as you understood from Laden's introductory speech, uh, any investment will be rising up GDP. In the meantime, share of investments in GDP has been shrinking. And it has been shrinking quite a lot. You see, it's compared to, to Greece, to Bulgaria, so uh, we had been actually degrowing in a sense. And we are not competitive. So it, it's not maybe uh, the, the most important issue. 
but if you have an open economy, then it is an issue. As Martin said, uh, our GDP uh, volume, this is in uh, uh, calculated in purchasing uh, power uh, units. It is quite below the uh, European average, so I would say if we talk about degrowth, the there are other countries in the European Union who, in my opinion, could start earlier and then we may follow later. And on the social side, we have 20% of population below poverty line, as I said now, 30% even, if, if it is the same indicator. And measured by Gini, we are also quite weak compared to, to Sweden. You see we have 32 and Sweden is 26. And people are generally not satisfied with their income. So they believe that they should be earning much more in order to live uh, satisfactory lives. So we come uh, a little bit on the opinion side. This is how uh, people around the world, this has been, uh, this is research which has been done in about 30 uh, major economies in the world last year. And these top 10 global concerns are pretty stable in the past year. So you see environmental pollution is on the fifth place stably and climate change is on the 10th place. If you go to Croatia, we see that people are mostly but like the rest of the world, so it is very much uh, compatible with, with the Western world, uh, that major problems are economic. So when you ask people about what they are concerned most, this is economic issues, unemployment, and stuff like that. Uh, if you ask them <coughs> how they see economic growth in context of environmental protection, then you see that majority thinks that we need economic growth to protect environment and even more people are not ready to sacrifice anything uh, of their material standard of living in order to improve the environment. So I would say this gives us political context in a democratic system, how people perceive the situation and the priorities. So to wrap it up, we have low well, in industrial sector, weak, extensive cultural sector, we import food, energy dependency is rising, high unemployment, and big public support for additional sector. So that means that we have to do something. And uh, clearly not what we have been doing up to now. Globally, what we are facing is climate change. So even Bloomberg uh, warned after the uh, Sandy hurricane in, in the States that, hey guys, stop talking that it is not connected to global warming. So business community accepting the fact that we are already in the process of consequences of global warming and the latest uh, assessments show that uh, we will be passing to Celsius degrees of increase in global temperatures which automatically means that we have to think about mitigation and adaptation to the consequences and of course looking <coughs> for instruments that will prevent further warming. But still now, we need adaptation mitigation, and this is immediately co connected with the investments. Interestingly enough, if you want to stay within uh, two Celsius degrees, you would have to leave two thirds of remaining fossil fuel reserves. It's very interesting. And the implications is immediately on price, on energy prices. So uh, this is taken from a UNDP study. Uh, implications of climate change for Croatia are worrying, so primarily for agriculture sector, but also for our production of electrical energy from renewable sources, from hydroelectric power. And assessment is like in all countries in the world that those who will be hit most will be <coughs> poor people, poor households, low income. This is interesting. <coughs> Graphcon showing that already since 2004-2005, while the energy, the oil prices have been soaring, actually the supply has been stable. That indicates that perhaps uh, we are talking about conventional oil, that oil producers really cannot catch up with an increasing demand. So we are now in recession for the fifth five fifth year in Croatia, but also globally, you know, that the economic situation is not, 
nearly dynamic as it was before the crisis. So as soon as China and India start growing faster, the prices are very likely to go up. Another thing which nobody or is not publicly really uh, mentioned is that there may be a peak coal also. There is a lot of coal, but this coal is not ac easily accessible. So it is not a question of not having coal, but it is a question of how much money and how much energy you need to take this coal out of the ground. So this is published by geologists. And uh, whether they are uh, right or wrong, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, definitely, according to these calculations, coal is not as available as we saw before. The implications of this situation are that energy prices and household energy costs will increase. In Croatia, we have already substantial amount of energy poverty. This is the uh, amount of the household income that goes for uh, electricity, heating, uh, cooking, everything that is not driving. So we are already between 15 and 25 percent. So with rising energy prices, household will become even poorer. Transfer costs will increase. This immediately uh, will affect food prices, and again, major impact will be on the poor households, unemployed, and so on. So quickly on that. So whenever we look for a solution, we have three different domains which are tightly interconnected: social, environmental, and economic. So if you want to improve somewhere on the environment, we have to look what happens in the economy, in the society, and for every of these complex systems. Basically, the idea is that when our human systems are completely dependent on environment, that is clear. So from environment, we take resources and we uh, live in that waste and heat. And if we destroy this substrate of our existence, so there is, there is nothing. So we can go back and dig the fields or hunt what deer. <laughs> uh, how we govern the human system depends on our worldview, so how we see the world. And how we see the world, what is our system of values and beliefs, uh, that will influence the institutional setting and also the technology. And institutional setting and technology have actually uh, govern our patterns of production and consumption. To wrap it up, this means logical and functional dependence. That means that economic dynamics is based dependent on institutional dynamics and institutional dynamics is based on worldview dynamics, so in our ideas. The easiest example is China. While China was sticking to the Marxist dogma, uh, they haven't been growing at all. They, the economy was clean, green, poor. When they changed their minds and accepted <laughs> that this model uh, will never produce uh, prosperity and any kind of economic or political strength for China, they adopted capitalist institutions and then transformed radically their economy. You know the China is today uh, first exporter in the world. They surpassed even Germany. So it was quite easy to go from here to there by changing institutional setting. But how about going back? This is very difficult. Complex systems. I, I don't have time to go through it. What I want to say is we really cannot govern these systems in a rational way. So we really can't, that is the modernist, uh, modernist illusion, and it is very much in the Marxist uh, theory, that we can rationally organize our systems. But we prove the historical proof that we are not able. And because all these systems are characterized by unpredictability, unintended consequences, radical uncertainty. So you do, you change one thing and then 10 other things changed, and which you didn't want to change, they change in a way that you didn't predict. So it's called for humility and cautious action. That means we have, to, uh, we have to frame our policies in a very, uh, in a very pragmatic and uh, careful way. We shouldn't be trying to make huge leaps in unexplored grounds, because we are getting into, into dangers to fail completely. And accumulation of historical uh, contingencies means that you just cannot escape from your history. So uh, I can come back to this later if somebody wants to ask. But uh, 
there is a certain drag, certain inertia in systems, which we cannot overcome easily. De therefore, we cannot get out of the fossil fuel paradigm easily. We cannot get of the uh, individual transport easily. There is the whole infrastructures behind it. Infrastructures, habits, a lot of things. So we just we have to understand that these are real uh, constraints in the system. If you just think that we can deal with it easily, it's wrong. So GDP growth and technological development are based on these characteristics which stem from the capitalist institutions, basically. Because the capitalist economy is the only historic economy that succeeded to grow and to produce technological change and development. If we introduce, because we know that we have a problem with the environment, with climate, and so on. If we introduce additional institutional constraints that will change the nature of market processes with the goal to drive efficiency, but specific efficiency, efficiency, let's say, in energy and resource use, that is already very well known. And also a certain kind of technological development, let's say technological development that will uh, guide us in post-carbon economy or decarbonized economy. Okay. We can also address uh, the inequality by tax policy and then uh, smooth these differences between firms and households and redistribute this money which has been concentrated naturally on this process in a smaller number of companies and households and use it for social purposes. And then we can, if we succeed, green the economy so we can have a different growth and at the end we can have no growth. I mean, it's, it's not necessary. So the system as it is, theoretically, this is based on, on not on, on my thinking, but other people. So the, the, theoretically it is possible. If it can work, it is questionable. So we have a problem, as we addressed before. I will not go through it, I will go to the solution. So my opinion, austerity, which our government is pursuing, like the majority of the governments in Europe, is not a solution. Degrowth at this point, for me, it would be a bad strategy, even if it was politically possible, viable, because we need to change economic structure and we need to have investments if we are to cope with problems that will come from the energy crisis and from climate change. So we need to reindustrialize the economy, but we need a different structure, not structure which is oriented towards exporting to Australia or to South America or whatever, but covering our local needs so that we are not under pressure to import nearly everything. And so on. I will not go into detail of this. You see it by yourself. We can uh, discuss this later. And then, for the, at the end, practical, uh, what does it do practically in this industrial policy? Smart irrigation system because we will have problems even at this level of low uh, food production if we do not invest. And these are investments, it's great economic growth. Food processing cluster, we are importing 50% of food, not only raw food, but processed food. We can become net exporter. This export can be based on organic, which creates additional uh, price uh, markups and we can, we can earn more money and stabilize uh, our trade balance. Railroad network, if you want to decarbonize transport system, you need to invest in railroads. If you want to go from Zagreb to Belgrade, you can take have eight hours, right? There's straight lines, we could get there in, in two hours if necessary, or Rijeka Zagreb, or uh, Zagreb Osijek, or whatever. So for that, you need investments. Ur urban public transport, of course, it's underdeveloped. Whatever we would like to do here, we would need to invest. Energy efficient buildings, again, solar panel on every roof, like, like a mod, why not? Germany is uh, much less insulated uh, country than Croatia and they are the first country in the world in terms of installed uh, solar, power, uh, solar panels. Renewable energy, solar biomass, there is no wind and on purpose. I don't believe that we need windmills in Croatia, that windmills in Croatia will help us substantially compared to the problems uh, that they create in terms of landscape and stuff like that. Smart grids. We lose in the electroenergetic system in Croatia 
uh, about 35 to 70% are colleagues here who know this better. If you want to improve this, you need to invest. Household waste management system. We are at the bottom of in the euro, at the bottom. We throw out nearly everything like if we were the most uh, rich country. There is a lot of uh, raw materials and energy that we just put on the landfill and then we have a problem how to manage the landfill. In order to improve this, you need investments. And this can be organized in industrial clusters. All this at the end can be functionally interconnected and by self-organization and by uh, government policy, we can succeed in having better, more resilient and more efficient economy in all terms, in terms of energy, carbon, and in terms of uh, whatever, yeah, higher employment and so on. But I don't believe that this can come true because I don't see in Croatia, and neither the socialists have believed that we are really talking about real trends that we will we'll be facing in five to ten years or, or before. We need a vision and commitment beyond election terms. We don't see it, and I don't see the political uh, parties in Croatia that could take this, and stakeholder consensus. Otherwise, as Mladen said, uh, we can't have a democratic solution. And just for the end, to see that there is beyond that, if we would like to make major changes, and these major changes, in my opinion, cannot happen at the level of a small country like Croatia. First of all, we are getting the European Union, so we have to take on whatever institutionally they will be uh, putting on the table in the context of what we are talking about now. So if the world will change, but on the European wide level, and that means shift our materialistic values and growth obsession, and if we will decide that we are ready to have and pay for high energy prices, that would give a good signal both to households and to industry to restructure, then we could have via oil tax, we are green government subsidies and stuff like that, we could have a ma major changes in the economy. But for that, as I said, it, is, it needs a really substantial change in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know you've got a gazillion of questions, but um, as our two lecturers have been debating this issue, um, over email for, um, for the last few months and have spent a good 20 minutes before we started also engaging in the debate. I want them to um, clear out the lectures first and then so you note down your questions, write them down, Daniel's got paper if you want, or remember them and uh, we're going to launch into debate in the next 20 minutes. Then. But uh, this is Brian, Brian Davey and um, our second lecturer tonight. We, we weren't actually uh, disagreeing very much in the just before this meeting, I have to say. Okay, okay. Um, the clickers are... The clickers over there. And, yeah, and, uh, we've got a bit of a noise issue with the ventilation, which is not air conditioning, but just all the ventilation of the building, so either shout or use the mic if you... Okay, well, can, can you hear me at the back? Yes. yes. Good. Um, well, thank you for inviting me, and um, uh, thank you for having this discussion in English because um, um, obviously otherwise I wouldn't be able to participate and, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, uh, obviously I'm a, somewhat at a disadvantage because I can't really claim I have an expert on the uh, Croatian economy in the same way that Igor is. Um, and, but, so I'm going to mainly frame my remarks in what you might call a general, a generalist a kind of way, but they do um, relate to some of the things that Igor has said. Um, here's a very quick um, background s statement of what the problem is. The problem is at the moment that we do not have economic growth, we have uneconomic growth. That is to say, the increase in uh, production and economic organisation has more costs associated with it than it has benefits associated with it. Um, many of these costs um, are not necessarily now, they're um, for later, for future generations, but costs they certainly are. And 
I want to um, start by <coughs> the question of how you frame conceptually the idea of limits to economic growth. Um, one, of, one of the most famous studies about limits to economic growth was done by some system theorists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1972. It produced a quite famous book which was sponsored by um, the Club of Rome on, on the limits to economic growth. Um, and this is a, a representation of their predictions of the future made in 1972 um, which they described as business as usual. In other words, if there were no policies taken to deal with the problems that they foresaw happening, if there were no policies taken to deal with the problems, and in their, in their, in their view, nothing really has happened since 1972, then what would happen would be projections based on these dotted lines. Now, the it's a jumble of uh, lines here, but basically you get the general idea when you see non-renewable resources, the inputs to the economy, the inputs to the economy falling catastrophically. In other words, depletion in resources on the one hand, and on the other hand, pollution, the wastes and the toxic wastes of the economy rising on the other hand. And as a result of, of this, Although for a number of years industrial output per person increases, although services per person increases, and although for some time food per person increases, after a while the food per person, the industrial output per person and the services start to turn down. And in their projection that time is about now. And then after a few years the effects of that are so, uh, so disastrous that it has an impact on global population and global population starts to decline. So their point of collapse, namely the idea that things would collapse in population terms, was about 2030, preceded by these turndowns. Now those are the dotted lines. A few years ago, an Australian academic asked the question, well, what has actually happened? after 1972, how well have these predictions done? And these are these lines here, and they're not actually very bad. You won't get many economics um, projections over 30 years which are as good as that actually. But look, the point is that the point where you start to get problems is now. And indeed, we do start to have problems now. We've got rising food prices, We've got the recognition that the climate crisis, which is the result of pollution in the form of CO2, is rising um, at, at a catastrophic rate. And we've got um, a problem particularly in energy production, which, which Igor, or Igor talked about both of those things. And that rise in food prices and the resultant rise in energy prices is beginning to um, level off the, the rate of economic growth. Indeed, there's a recognition of that in, in major policy circles. I read before I came to this country um, that the um, German finance minister, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, had actually said that in Europe you shouldn't expect any, uh, any, any strong growth for the next few years. He's beginning to recognise that there is a serious problem. I would say it's, it's, it's not the next few years, um, for the next few decades, for maybe the next century, and it's going to get worse because these problems um, are the problems which also underpin the things which are in the news, namely a financial crisis um, and, um, um, and, and, um, and, and so on. I mean, the financial crisis is largely because if the economy can't grow, because food prices are rising, energy prices are rising, then people cannot service their debts because people to service their debts must have a rising income. If you want to pay back your debts with interest, you need to have a rising income. And when economies start to stagnate, you begin to get a debt crisis. It's particularly acute in countries which are of low competitiveness, sure, but basically that's the reason we are where we are now in the world economy. So that's where we are. 
I also read before I came an interview by Dennis Meadows, who, 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 who was one of the people who did this study, and he used this metaphor. Imagine you are in a, a, a factory which is, which is now empty and you're in a car, and you're driving in a straight line inside the factory. You will stop. You will stop for sure. The question is whether you stop because you put the brakes on, which is a managed stop, which is something where you try and manage the process, where you try and manage something which is inevitable, or alternatively, you will stop because you refuse to recognise as a wall and you will crash into it. Now, unfortunately, our political leaders in, in various countries and most, polo, uh, most economists as well refuse to believe there's a wall and they're driving hell for leather uh, to crash. <coughs> so what do we do about it? The problem we have is the economy, as it's con currently constituted, all capitalist economies do not have a reverse gear. If they start to stagnate, there's this problem, as I said, about people servicing their debts, so the banking and financial system gets in into increasing difficulties. Confidence drops. As confidence drops, the banks lend less money. Less money goes into circulation because the banks are creating money when they lend. Because people become pessimistic, they, they, they spend less. When they spend less, other people have less income. And the economy starts to go in a downward spiral. It is extremely difficult to manage a contraction in a capitalist economy. And that is why um, nobody wants to do it and why the economists say we must have economic growth. So the task in hand is to find and, and invent the institutions and the policies that are going to make a contraction a manageable uh, process. At the moment, we've got this kind of policy. Huge financial sector bailouts for the too big to fail institutions, the banks and so on, um, which is about trying to make them profitable again. And to the extent that it succeeds, then the rich get richer, the very rich get richer. Um, everybody else gets austerity measures, um, so that that in turn leads to more economic problems. Um, which leads to worse new economic conditions and the situation just goes round and round and you can see that in Greece and you can see that in Italy and all these countries. So it's, uh, it's this business of no reverse gear. So we need a different kind of political uh, arrangements and we need different kind of economic arrangements. And what I'm going to mainly talk about is the different kind of community economic arrangements that might survive the contraction that I, I'm talking about. And I'm going to talk about it as degrowth, but I'm not going to talk about it as the same as austerity. When Eagle put his slide up, he had austerity, stroke, degrowth. But not as the same thing as, <laughs> yeah, as two unacceptable okay. policies for the moment. Yeah, but, but the, 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 so anyway, let, let's talk, address the issue of well, what's the difference between um, degrowth and austerity. Now, what, what I'm wanting to say is that I don't know whether we're going to manage the contraction in uh, a way which um, is going to leave, um, is going to uh, be manageable, but let's have a try. Let's try and do it, and let's look at ways in which, despite this uh, contraction, uh, life for people might conceivably be made better. Um, what is it? Uh, it's not necessarily the case that people need more stuff in order to be happy. There are various other ways that society could be made uh, uh, pos uh, positive. By greater equality, by more free time, by supporting different value systems. Um, and um, <laughs> I, 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 I'll come back to that in a minute. And also by making um, places that people live and the communities and the neighbourhoods that they live more efficient and effective places. So let's, I want to look at the first three of those rather briefly and then go into the, the fourth one at more length. But there's research in, um, done by two UK academics, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, in a book called The Spirit Level, um, which, are, which, which shows some United Nations data. 
that countries which are more equal in income terms had less drug use, better mental health, less crime, less violence, better life expectancy, lower obesity, less teenage pregnancy, greater child well-being. All of these can be found in the United Nations data, which is telling us that a more equal society is our happier society. That's one way of improving society. Another thing, not everybody, but quite a few people actually would like to, if they can, and in fact do, what's, what's called um, um, downshift. I think it's called downshifting. They trade income for more time. They accept a lower income in order to have more free time for themselves. Um, there are, there's some studies being done in the United States and Australia that about uh, a fifth to a quarter of the population in a five-year period have actually deliberately done that, people in the working age group. Um, and then the social psychological research is my third point. In multiple countries internationally, around which this um, piece of paper that you were given when you came in, incidentally, is all about. Um, this, this is a, based on a study, um, many studies which have been done by um, psychologists into what motiv motivates people in cross-cultural um, studies and then grouped together. Um, and um, you may be interested to know that um, overwhelmingly the values of the people in this room are in what's called the universalist uh, framework, namely the top um, right-hand corner. Um, I, I suppose it shouldn't surprise because <laughs> you've come to the, uh, this particular uh, meeting. But what is interesting from the economics point of view is that economics as a subject discipline and the assumptions of market economics is almost entirely that we're in the other, we're almost the opposite direction, the other side, that people are motivated in, in the economic textbooks and, in the, and, and, and by the underpinnings of policy as if they're all, as, all about um, wealth, social power, uh, ambition, authority, and all the rest of it. Um, so what we need then are social and economic institutions which express the kind of values of the people in this room, um, and which, which will work with the kind of values of the people in this room. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about is making more effective neighbourhoods, more effective households, more effective places to live. Now, there's a, a, a new discipline of biophysical economics that's been developed over the last few years. And there's some fascinating facts coming out of biophysical economics. One of the most fascinating facts is in a developed country, only 10% of the time of the population is spent in paid work. 10%. In China, it's about 20%. But it's still, the overwhelming majority of time is spent outside of work. Not just because um, people who are at work need to go home and sleep and eat and all those things, but of course because children spend their time um, at home, elderly people spend their time at home, unemployment people spend their time at home. So overwhelmingly, the economic activities are in the household sector. 90% is in the household sector, not in the paid work sector. Now, originally, economics, um, when it started off in the period of Aristotle and the ancient Greeks and so on, was about how you managed households. And what I'm suggesting is we need to think about um, returning to some of those kinds of ideas. And we need to think about ecological efficiency so that the food, the energy, and the materials are provided close to home. And if you think it very simple, if you insulate your house, you need to buy in less energy. So an improvement there is where you need to buy less you need to buy less um, if you are growing more of your own food, for example, if you're buying less energy and so on. We can consciously design uh, and, and develop neighbourhoods and communities so that people can buy less and provide more from their own households and they, uh, provide uh, more from close to home. And the, 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 the cartoons are to try and express that in a very neat and simple way. And they're the kind of institutions that we can set up to make that possible. And this is uh, the pictures of um, uh, a, a, a place in Munich, München, the Haus der eigenen Arbeit. Haus der eigenen Arbeit has, is a neighbourhood centre which has workshop facilities for woodworking, metalworking, paper, book binding, jewellery, textiles, upholstery and so on, uh, arts, crafts, glass, a blacksmith, 
and so on. So that, and people don't just work there to make stuff rather than buy it in the department store. They, they, they work there for other reasons too. A, because they, they enjoy a new, developing a new skill. They're enjoying their work. And B, because it's a great place to socialise, new, develop new skills and so on. It's a different way of thinking about life and so on. Okay. This, this is a, a, a bit more about the, the, this, this idea of developing a community economy. This is, these are two pictures from a project I helped develop in Nottingham in England. Uh, the people there are building a straw bale building. Um, it took them about several years to do it, but it was all done entirely on voluntary labour for the pleasure of doing it. Um, and it cost very little uh, money. Uh, that's, that's one end of this straw bale building. So what I'm talking about is developing a, 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 a Places where people develop a different lifestyle package, where they, they do things because they enjoy doing them, and where they provide more of their own needs close to home, where they don't so much uh, spend all their time doing stressful work in order to earn money, in order to buy stuff in the supermarket. And that requires different management approaches in order to, that these different um, uh, community economic um, uh, relationships are organised on a different basis. You can't organise community economic relationships on the usual uh, management, top-down, command and control, we know what's best for you uh, kind of system of, of management. It needs to be a different way. Uh, there are ways of thinking about this. This is a very complicated diagram, but the, basically what I'm saying is that the, as far as possible, the, these kind of projects at a local level should be evolved without in interference from outside um, but they can be networked together where it's appropriate and only where it's appropriate for a greater good. To, to, where it's appropriate to deal with potential conflict, right, because several organisations are, are, are trying to get money together, to develop synergies, to develop a common strategic view and so on. But all this requires a bigger framework of policy. It requires a bigger framework of policy in the tax system, the money and banking system, the energy system, and unfortunately I was only given... <laughs> 20 minutes um, to talk about these things, so um, uh, a very, very little time. And it's unfortunate that these are, are connect most with the sort of thing that Igor was saying, but um, very quickly, the, one of the problems of the sort of this, this strategy I've discussed, where you create a nice place to live, is if somebody owns the land in that nice place to live, <laughs> hey, guess what? They'll put the rent up because people will want to live there, they'll put the rent up and they'll be the beneficiary of a community's activities. Well, you want to create a taxation system where that can't happen and, and um, that, that, that money is taxed away uh, to a local government that channels it back into those community facilities. That would also uh, be a land value tax which would also stabilise the banking system because most of the banking system is credit on, on the basis of land, land valuation. Uh, we also need reform of the banking uh, system. Uh, again, I haven't really got much time to talk about it, but most people don't realise that money is brought into circulation when banks create it effectively. And the problem is that if banks create money when they lend, in conditions of uh, recession, there's no confidence for borrowing and, um, and there's no confidence for lending, so they don't create money, which is then a bit, rather a bit of a problem. You, well, you should have uh, money created um, in a recession, and so money shouldn't be created by the banking system, it should be created in a, as part of a public process in order to reflate the economy. And so I agree we should have a money system which creates and prevents unemployment, but I don't <coughs> see um, the prevention of unemployment as, as being um, uh, a problem in relation to degrowth, because I see degrowth as being essentially about reducing the amount of energy that goes into an economic system. Because the amount of stuff that is produced in an economic system depends on the amount of energy that goes through it. And it's desperately necessary when um, most of the energy that goes into our economies is carbon-based energy um, to bring down the uh, 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 rate of, um, uh, uh, of, of carbon input. Um, this, is, this is a, a thing reflecting what Igor was saying. I think I'd probably run out of time, have I? Yeah, you're at the end, but do you want to wrap it up? Or? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up. With, with that, I think it's possible to bring down 
the amount of uh, uh, car carbon emissions and simply by banning the sale of fossil fuels unless you've got a, a permit to sell fossil fuels and reducing the number of permits very rapidly over time. So the amount of fossil fuels that can get in the economy is actually reduced very rapidly and doing that in a fair way. And there's a policy I call cap and share for that purpose, but I haven't got time to talk about it. If you want to know more about it, you'll have to ask a question about it or talk to me afterwards in the pub. <laughs>
You can't force people to do this because in, if you were to force people to do that, you, you've lost the entire ethos of them immediately. <coughs> the second thing I would say um, is that um, my experience is that um, you can make such projects attractive um, because <coughs> they're fun places to be. I mean, um, the, the community garden project that, that uh, I uh, was in, associated with developing, there must have been thousands and thousands of people who have been there on a nice summer's day to have the, the food, to have their lunches, or at different times to help out, or at different times to the festivals, or to the um, events where we did wassailing, which is a tradition of beating the trees to wake them up so that they will um, give uh, good apples which you can then turn into cider and, and so on and so forth. So th this is about making the process enjoyable in its own, in its own right. This, the, 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 the other part of the, the argument is that the fact is that, as I say, if you don't find a, a way, um, the car will hit the wall, to use that, that metaphor. The crisis is on, and in places like Greece, for example, people are really struggling to survive. Now, what we're talking about here is developing what I would call lifeboat projects. Um, you know, it's developing emergency economic arrangements to sustain people through processes which will happen in one way or the other anyway. So it's about making the best that you can out of something that is going to happen. Um, the alternative to this is that the... Um, uh, the, the, there will be increasing inequality and there'll be what Naomi Klein, the American radical author, calls uh, disaster capitalism, where uh, essentially as things get worse and worse, the people who I would call the money junkies um, make a lot of money out of hiring mercenaries, out of building prisons, out of uh, security apparatuses, out of exploiting increasingly vulnerable uh, people and so on. And um, that's, the, that's the, the other alternative. And, you know, I think it's really important to develop these lifeboat projects that people will gravitate to. And indeed, there are in Greece, for example, some, I, I, I like the example of the so-called potato movement in, in Greece. Um, the potato movement in Greece, if you, do, if you don't know about it, is that a lot of people are now so poor in the situation of austerity, that um, uh, some local authorities decided that they would invite local farmers to bring potatoes into the middle of town on the back of lorries where people could buy them a lot cheaper than they can get them in the supermarket and where the farmers can get a better price than they can get at the supermarkets. So they're actually cutting out the supermarket, which is an integral part of this kind of economic system that we're trying to get rid of, and developing a, a, a relationship between local farmers and local people. And uh, I, I, I've got friends in Ireland who are de also developing community farming arrangements, relationships between uh, people and farmers and so on. So what I'm suggesting is that some of these arrangements can be evolved out of the crisis as a response that people have in order to survive the crisis and as far as possible uh, keep their morale up. Okay, I would, I would add to this that what Brian said, there are a lot of such examples in the Western world. Uh, cooperatives uh, which are growing something, cooperatives which are buying together something from individual producers, like for example organic food. Uh, I remember that in Russia, uh, in the transition period, there was a lot of orchards uh, in the cities, everywhere uh, among the skyscrapers where people were planting uh, vegetables just in order to cope with, with the crisis. So this is a bottom-up emergent process. And this is uh, consistent with uh, complex system theory, which says that uh, evolution of the system is driven by local fluctuations. That means that we cannot change the system top-down, and we have tried on several occasions in history. But we uh, should not forget what you addressed <laughs> is that uh, there is accumulation of historical contingencies. That is what we are now. But the changes are happening and they can drive the system in an unpredictable way and uh, in a probabilistic way. We can't know that it will succeed and that it will be before crash. 
And I think we have to live with this. So what Brian said and what actually drives the system are such uh, local fluctuations, which can be helped a little bit, top-down institutions. So you don't go, you don't want to, uh, to kill them at the outset. But I think that what we have to accept, from my point of view and from my understanding of complex systems, that maybe we will crash, maybe we will not crash, but we have to accept the, the uh, possibility that we will crash and then the system will change radically and it will cost a lot of more in economic and in human terms. But uh, there, I don't believe that there is possibility that there is a messiah who will save the world just saying, okay, we are going to crash and we have to do something by any way. I think it is worse than crashing. If so. There is an American uh, system scientist, uh, Howard Odium, who wrote a book 10 years ago with uh, his brother, A Prosperous Way Down. And he showed how the way down, degrowth actually, can be engineered over a longer period of time. And this is actually the best systemic description of degrowth that I have seen. Thank you. Um, so as I said, there's brandy at the back, uh, and I think this last point was referring to political institutions, so I guess Daniela's going to take us in that direction as well, but the next question will not record it, blood is next. I want to thank both of, both of our speakers. Uh, my question is related to what, to what the, the discussion that Stalin started, but I want you to be more direct about how do you think that social change happens, because uh, a lot of what Brian uh, gave um, uh, attention to is changing individual behavior and as much as that you know can be important in terms of um, understanding humans both as cooperative and competitive and we can work on the co co you know the cooperative side and so forth but I mean only focusing on an individual agency um, is in that you know there's the, the danger that it just creates kind of a complementarity kind of a third domain but leaving the economic and the political system as they are and I think I don't think we can be happy with this given you know, the extent of changes that you say that we need. So I, I want both of you to say how do you think social change happens in the sense of changing the structure, changing the economic system. Are you evolutionary, evolutionist or revolutionary? So I'm, I'm definitely evolutionist. Therefore, I call my third section a socio-economic tinkering. Tinkering is not your character. Uh, I, I don't think that we can deal with uh, complex systems in, in any other way because of these unintended consequences, radical uncertainty, uh, because we cannot never know uh, the details of the system, the details of interactions and connections like in ecosystem because all this uh, that uh, I am uh, <coughs> applying to uh, socio-economic context comes from uh, ecological uh, sciences, from process ecology. So. I, therefore, I think that system can be changed little by little. That's also idea of uh, Karl Popper in his famous uh, 57 book, uh, The Poverty of Historicism, where he said, what we can do in social terms, it just socioeconomic, he called it, he called it piecemeal engineering. And the capitalist system evolved just like uh, according to piecemeal uh, socioeconomic engineering. If we remember in Karl Marx times, uh, children were working uh, uh, 12 hours a day. There was no restrictions on any kind in terms of uh, how uh, factory owners could treat the workers. There was no social security. And of course, such system was not sustainable. But with uh, institutional tinkering, the system became more resilient, more robust. It created more wealth for the majority. And in the meantime, it also created a huge ecological problem, which makes this unsustainable in, in a mid-term or, or long-term, whatever it is. So I think it can happen, but piece by piece, and with this uh, general uncertainty whether it will work or not. OK, uh, well, I think that, that, that what's really crucial is that people have some kind of experience um, of a different, what, a different life being possible through the experience of working in um, institutions or new organisations and so on. It doesn't have initially to be making long-term commitments. It, it's just that they exist, that people can pop in and go to these places and so on. But more than just people's experience of working within uh, these kind of alternative institutions like House to Eigen and Arbeit, Community Gardens, Community Energy Projects, more than that, uh, there has to be, to my point of view, a common narrative 
I know it's unfashionable um, and people don't like the idea of the grand narrative because Marxism uh, and, and, and fascism and so on are these grand narratives um, which then became the basis of totalitarian ideologies and, and um, uh, for, uh, for cementing top-down structures so that the alternative to this kind of grand narrative um, it seems to me has to be in a, a strong idea that what we're doing is something which is networked, distributed, um, to, make, to be made coherent, but where the actual um, uh, network and so the, 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 the coherence is created by, with, at the same time with minimal interference in what the local level projects do. Um, and um, that was what, what I was trying to show with that idea of the viable systems model, which is by a, a Simonetician called Stafford Beer. Because there's two elements um, to uh, developing a, 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 a different kind of social, bigger social process. One is the issue of motivations, but the other is the issue of organisation, your organisational techniques and ma management systems. So I, I, I think that we need to look at the management systems that are, are, are going to be uh, useful and that are not top-down command and control. So um, particularly at the moment there are debates going on about the importance of commons um, being promoted by Heinrich Böll and a number of other organisations. Um, I think they're compatible with the ideas of uh, uh, Stafford Beer and so on and cy uh, cybernetic systems. But they're very, very important. I mean one of the, the crucial things that happened that's sent us off in, into this crisis is the way in which um, commons were broken up and enclosed so that in the past you had communities as groups of people had a relationship with the landscape in which they lived and collectively managed the landscapes. These were not hierarchical things, this was a, a kind of vernacular people's level thing where people collectively managed the landscapes and the waterscapes in which they lived at a level that was sustainable and where they knew about these, these environments. The problem has been that when the, uh, the, when the, the landscapes were, in, were enclosed, um, that most people, a lot of people have lost that relationship to environment um, and um, they also lost the communal and community uh, democracy and equality associated with it as well. So we need to think about how we're going to recreate those kinds of things. Thank you. Just before we move on to the next one, Daniela, did this answer the questions of dichotomy? I've got the question from Lada here and then I'm recording one there. I think it's just a short one. Um, Igor, I, I really loved your presentation, but I, I noticed somehow that you didn't define degrowth. Uh, I think it would help this discussion to, to, to a huge extent. If you could just say whether you, for example, agree with Brian's definition that it, it entails um, um, a lessening of material consumption, that, but to, in my opinion, listening to you and having read some materials about it, I think it's kind of uh, the, the only framework in which we can think, because to, to mess this up with GDP would uh, lead us into some directions which are uh, quite hard to understand. And secondly, so just your definition of degrowth first. Second, um, if you do agree with Brian on, uh, on the definition of degrowth, as he put it, uh, could you just comment on how, um, um, how um, incompatible or you said it, it, degrowth was incompatible with acquis uh, comité, with institutional framework of the European Union. But as a matter of fact, then at communal level, as you said, you know, Brian said, um, there are some initiatives, and you mentioned cooperatives, um, which which could be put into this to, to this purpose. Could you just comment on that? There was a slide Brian where he mentioned that uh, we need uh, to consume less, have more free time, and. Uh, what was else there? I, I fully agree with that. I mean, and this is not incompatible. What I suggested that we need to invest in order to restructure the economy to make it more resilient, in order to face climate change, energy prices, and current social uh, 
crisis which comes from high unemployment. It can be done in parallel because it is not really uh, conflicting. That means if we are uh, having more people who are working, that means, and if we want to have uh, near full employment, that definitely at the present level of technology means that individually we should be working less. So it is not incompatible. It also doesn't mean that while we are investing, let's say, into necessary infrastructure that I described there, that at the same time we need to increase our personal consumption above any uh, reasonable level. So it is really not uh, uh, incompatible. And then, as, as you see, I deleted at one point the, ver the growth term, uh, GDP growth. We, first, GDP is very... Uh, poor indicator of economic prosperity. It doesn't take anything what happens in the household. It takes in whenever we pollute the environment or put people in jail. And so uh, GDP is very poor indicator. So at the end of the day, we, we can do without it. And uh, as Philip Lohn, uh, Australian ecological economist, uh, argued, we could have a virtual growing economy, which is growing by inflation, by a small inflation rate, just to piece down, uh, to piece down uh, the, the financial markets. And you can do this by capping on materials and energy that come into the system. So you can have virtual growth if you want, but not the material and energy growth. And I fully agree with Brown and he said, at the end of the day, we have to stop, we have to decrease the input of energy in the, of the, in the system. But in the, in the, let's say, in the short term, we need to use this energy more intelligently just to cope uh, with the problems that we have already created. Did I just... I, I think I probably agree with Igor, but there is a, there's a, there, there is, there is a serious problem. And um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't claim that I necessarily have the solution to this problem. For example, if you want to build a lot of wind turbines to replace um, fossil fuel power, and you want to build a lot of um, uh, solar panels, um, that building, though the building of those um, pieces of equipment itself takes energy. And at the moment, most of the energy supply is supplied by fossil fuels. So, um, uh, at one point, Igor dis described a great long list of, of things that you, 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 you thought you, you would want to, to do, um, uh, the, right towards the end of your, your talk. And that was, a, that was quite a substantial list. Uh, what I fear in this, and I'm saying I don't have the answer to this, what I fear in, in this long list is that that represents a requirement for a lot of energy and material inputs. So that's the, and it's a dilemma, it's a predicament. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, um, there, that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Around yeah. network, the food processing, all, all, all these things represent a requirement for a lot of material and energy inputs. And the problem is, um, maybe we've, we've already reached the end of the road and, and we actually can't have a lot more um, inputs. So the, 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 the issue is how then is it, is it going to be done? So sure, we have to have um, some, of those, some of those things, but how much of those things are we going to, is going to be possible in the conditions of contraction? So the, uh, this, this, I would describe this as a, a dilemma um, or, or a predicament. And the difference between a predicament and a problem is that with a the problem, there's a solution. With the predicament, there isn't an obvious solution, and we're in a predicament on this, and I think we need to, 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 to recognize that. Yeah, I, yeah, I had a question. Right. I mean, I'm wondering, because when you show us this, uh, um, these are very serious policy measures, but I wonder how do you plan to come to them without any politics, which you are, like withdrawing from very radically. How would this happen? Is it for both of the speakers? Uh, no, this is for Mr. Martinovich, okay. right? Yes. And then the, the other speaker, in fact, I think is withdrawing radically and just saying we are going to crash the wall and we are building lifeboats. This is how I understood. You are just offering the, the small solutions, like accepting the, the situation as it is, and let's figure out how to survive it. I, 
like for both of you, I don't understand what would be the, 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 the changes in terms of politics, because uh, I disagree with you that the capitalism changed by small adaptations. It was a result of a quite serious political struggle as well. Okay, it's okay, yes. It didn't come out of nothing, not but nothing. it came out of social and economic problems. It helped to create. It created these problems, and these problems have been solved. Uh, who will do this? Uh, in a democratic system, they should be political parties who should be taking on these like Green Party. I've been talking to the Green Party in Greece recently uh, on behalf of Green European Foundation and there were members of the Greek Green Party who don't have seats in the parliament and who are listening to this lecture and three other lectures. Uh, if we don't make this agenda to the political arena, nothing will happen. How can we do it? Well, we are one of these local fluctuations here. We are creating, exchanging uh, uh, thoughts, uh, knowing each other, something may happen. But there is no straightforward way uh, how to do it, because you know, even Angela Merkel, Merkel, who was very much green before the crisis, has withdrawn from uh, subsidizing uh, Green, uh, 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 green energy uh, from the solar uh, sector and stuff like that. So even those people who have been on the line, who has been uh, claiming that the European Union will be the number one, they will fulfill their claims, they are not doing this. So that is the world we live in. So uh, I don't see a straightforward solution. Well. The reason I didn't speak about the, the politics was because I had 20 minutes, and uh, I, I said um, at uh, the uh, I, I, I said towards the end that I simply haven't got enough time to go into these things. But, but, but talking about the tax system, uh, talking about the, the money in the banking system, and talking about energy policy, they are profoundly political things. Um, in order to be able to address those those things, however, you have to have a movement of people who actually want to see those things change and what I'm suggesting is that in, out of some of these kind of activities one might have a way of beginning to develop a political movement as well because uh, that movement will have to have complementary policies which, which will complete and um, make feasible the sorts of things that I'm talking about. I mentioned for example this business about the land value taxation. If, if landowners if all this community development stuff um, simply puts up um, rentals uh, and they're the beneficiaries, well then that's, that, that's going to kind of undermine the process. So they need, there's a logical um, set of taxation policies which uh, I would describe as land value taxation or site value taxation and so on. Now that's a whole big topic um, which I could speak on for another 20 minutes. Invite me back next year. I'll, I'll come. Um, right, coming to the next lesson next year. Thank you for your patience and um, to your turn. Croatia has a lot of different strategies, but after five years, there is no strategy going out of the crisis. Why is this fact? Why Croatia has no strategy going out of the crisis? After five years of the Right. Is it something our speakers can attempt to answer, um, given that none, neither of them works with Croatian strategy departments, but do you want to give it a shot? Well, my understanding, uh, we do not have the capacity to ask right questions at the political level, because in Croatia there are economists and there are institutes like Economic Institute Zagreb with people mm -hmm. who could have helped a lot. I can't say that they would have brought that out of the crisis in an environment which is hostile, say, which is not growing any anyway, and we are very much dependent on the, on the environment uh, in the European Union and uh, in the region. Uh, but we have such a politicians that do not understand economic processes, they do not understand the working of complex systems, and they do not want to ask people who may understand it and who are paid for it. And I'm referring here uh, to the Economic Institute of Zagreb. So, ask, ask uh, uh, Milanovic, I don't know why it is. Uh, I, I also don't understand. So. Uh, well, obviously I'm not an expert on <coughs> Croatia, but what I would say is that the, 
it's not just Croatia that has no way of dealing with these things. The politicians, in, most of the politicians in Greece don't have a way of dealing. Most of the politicians in Italy, in Britain, you know, everywhere you look, there is a, a, a political vacuum in relation to very serious problems of this kind. And, and uh, one of the interesting things for me, I read a book called um, Blessed Unrest by a, a, a man called Paul Hawkin. And Paul Hawkin um, used to go around the world giving talks uh, about economic, environmental, and social problems and so on. And everywhere he went, somebody, people would come up and give him their business cards afterwards. And the number of business cards grew and grew and grew. And in the end, he wrote a book about all the, the people and the business cards because he suddenly became interested in how it comes about that everywhere he went, there were people who were of very similar points of view um, in relation to the environment, in relation to economics, in relation to social problems and so on. And he, he started to study all these organisations and he came to the conclusion that globally there are between one half a million and a million organisations um, trying to do something at the local level in all these different countries all around the world, not individuals, half a million to a million organisations. But what these organisations lack is a, a, a way of drawing themselves together and, and developing a coherent strategy um, as, as, as groups. Um, that's the, the, the task we've got to sort out. Okay. Right. Um, I would just like to comment on... Uh on uh, Brian's um, comment regarding the investments uh, that Igor mentioned. Maybe you can go back to that slide. So basically, um, you said that uh, the growth is a question of uh, energy consumption or basically energy inputs into a system. And then you commented that uh, if we, for instance, uh, develop some of these solutions, which Igor mentioned, then basically that we will have to uh, increase uh, our energy consumption in order to develop them and uh, this would then be a bad thing. But I would actually disagree with you because, uh, I mean, for instance, you mentioned wind farms. Well, a wind farm repays itself energetically in six months. So the amount of money that you have to invest in to produce a wind farm, it repays itself rel relatively quickly. And the same thing is, for instance, with uh, an urban public transport system. So basically, um, this is also a huge savings of money uh, in, the, in the long term. In the short term, obviously, this would constitute an energy consumption issue. Uh, but in the long term, it would actually be a saving, leading to actually... energy consumption, because you take out individual transport. You yes. Will save you, you so will reduce energy. Yes, so in the future, basically, you will reduce uh, your energy consumption. So actually, these elements uh, here would then, in the long term, re lead to a certain degrowth uh, when it comes to actual energy, you know, use in, in, in a system. So I would just like to comment on, on, on this, and maybe you can uh, comment that. Yeah, I, I think the relevant words you used there were in the long term, and, and you said in the short term it, it might increase the energy consumption. The problem is that if you add them all together in the short term is, is, is a big hump. And when um, energy is becoming much more expensive, um, that's a problem. But it, might, it, it, it could be a problem. Part of the answer to, is, is the other thing you mentioned, namely what, what is the energy return on energy invested and, and finding criteria to decide between um, projects. But it's also the case that at the moment there are a lot of uh, I don't know whether you know this term, grand saloons. You, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term um, invented by some um, biophysical economists. Well, it's a term invented by the author Kurt Vonnegut to describe industry, academic, and political coalitions who are p pursuing futile agendas uh, on, the, uh, on the slogan that it's, it's going to be green wasting huge amounts of resources and going in the wrong direction. I mean, I'm, for example, thinking of something like biofuels. So, so um, there, there needs to be some political process to, to, to work out which, which of these things are relevant 
how much energy we can, we, we can afford and so on, and to weed out the grand falloons. And that's a, a political problem of dealing with uh, of, 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 you know, some very powerful lobbies. At this hour, these chairs are getting increasingly uncomfortable. And I'm grateful for your patience and perseverance. And if there are no more quick questions, quick questions? Well, then I'd ask you to join me in thanking Igor and Brian. and we'll continue it throughout the year in smaller seminars on our website so please stay tuned